Aquanat. Um, it's like a home from home being here on a Saturday morning, because normally I spend my Saturday morning at a coffee morning in my constituency, um, raising money for some good cause somewhere, in the, maybe in Ayleth or Pitlochry or Aberfeldy or in Perth City. And it starts at 10 o'clock. Um, by 11 o'clock, everyone's had their coffee and their uh, home baking and their things to buy. And then the raffle starts. <laughs> and in my part of the world, the raffle goes on for about 90 minutes. <laughs> as every item that was in last week's raffle is recycled <laughs> into this week's raffle. And after about 40 years of going to this raffle, you might get something you actually want as a consequence. So good luck. I hope the mug is fabulous when you win it uh, today. And David, you very kindly talked about how I um, engage with people in gatherings and, and listen to um, colleagues and, and perspectives of, of, uh, of our teaching profession around the country, uh, I'm going to have to do something about my, um, my discussion style because I had a, a, a lovely discussion upstairs with three teachers from Uphill Prim Uphall Primary School in West Lothian and um, one of them said to me halfway through it, I feel as if I'm being interviewed for a job with these <laughs> questions. So I'm going to have to maybe ease off, e ease off on the way in which the questions are asked but we're all learning, aren't we? Um, but it's, it's a real pleasure to be with you today, and I'm glad that the weather today is in something of a great contrast to when I was supposed to be here uh, back in March, and I'm delighted we've been able to reschedule uh, our uh, discussion today. Uh, I want to start off uh, talking about the, well, I want to talk today about the, um, the, the agenda that I'm pursuing in Scottish education, and uh, I want to set it in a context which makes it clear that the, the priorities that are on my mind just now and the issues that I'm pursuing just now are set within quite a long-standing context in the development of Scottish education. I want to go back to the national debate that led to the establishment of Curriculum for Excellence, the national debate that started in the late 1990s and the early part of, the, of this century, um, to essentially consider what was the right curricular approach for us to have in our schools. And fundamentally, after a lot of discussion, a lot of dialogue, a lot of interaction, a lot of position papers, um, which involved actually our predecessors in government in the Labour and Liberal uh, Executive, although as an opposition party, the SNP were very much involved in that debate within Parliament. And it was a good, thoughtful debate about what was the right approach to our curriculum within Scotland. We essentially settled on curriculum for excellence as a move away from a prescriptive syllabus to a framework for education, which was hugely dependent on the contribution and the thinking and the creativity of our teaching profession. And in my view, that was the right judgment to make. I, have, I, I will defend to my last breath, breath the, uh, the move to Curriculum for Excellence because I think what Curriculum for Excellence represents is an approach which best meets the needs of the young people of Scotland today as they face a world that is changing at a faster rate than any of us could ever conceive would have been the case. And the difference that, uh, between the, the, the framework of Curriculum for Excellence and a more prescriptive syllabus is that I feel we would always be behind the curve with a prescriptive syllabus, where with the framework of Curriculum for Excellence we have the opportunity to adapt our approach on education to the needs and the interests and the perspectives of young people as they emerge today in our society and as they face the challenges of an ever-changing world. But fundamentally, Curriculum for Excellence relies on the quality and the strength of teacher judgment and the quality and strength of teacher professionalism. And for that all to be uh, possibly been realised, we need to have networks like STEP who are engaged in supporting teachers in their professional development and we need very many other players in Scottish education through the, the work of our local authorities or Education Scotland or other professional networks to be supporting that development of professional practice. But CFE also relies very heavily on the need for there to be an empowered profession, a profession that is confident about taking the decisions that are required to shape the educational needs of young people as they present to them within uh, our society. 
So a big theme of what of my agenda as I take forward the policy priorities of the government, and it's a huge privilege for me to be the Education Secretary and to have the opportunity to work with you to shape the future of Scottish education in the years to come. A big priority for me is to make sure that we've got an empowered school system, an empowered school-led education system where the interaction that you are undertaking with young people in our schools is able to, uh, you're able to be responsive and decisive to the needs of young people in your own circumstances and they will vary from different parts of the country, whether that's in the Highlands where I was yesterday at Caldeen Primary School or whether that's in the um, areas of rural Scotland that I represent in Perthshire or whether it's in some of our inner city communities in Glasgow or in Edinburgh. These circumstances will be different and I want our schools to be empowered and our professionals to be empowered to be able to take the right decisions that affect the education of young people in our schools. And we've started taking the steps uh, along that journey to establish the link between curriculum for excellence, which relies upon an empowered teaching profession, to make sure we actually create that empowered teaching profession within our schools. One of the first and the boldest steps we've taken is pupil equity funding. And one of the joys that I have in going around the country and having those conversations that feel more like a job interview than, um, than a polite conversation, is to probe schools about what they're doing with pupil equity funding. And it's been fascinating to see, again, the different choices that are made around the country. Um, if I can perhaps marshal two different choices. A few weeks ago, I was in Towerbrank Primary School in, in Portobello in, in Edinburgh, um, where the school had decided, you know, they'd looked at their issues and their challenges and they believe their challenges to exist in the strength of their pedagogy in maths and numeracy. So they would brought in a maths specialist, and not only were the children finding that they were getting enhanced lessons from the maths specialist, but the staff were telling me that the professional development that they were receiving from that investment was helping their professional practice, and the whole school was strengthened as a consequence of that decision that was made. Yesterday, at Caldeen Primary School in Inverness, in an area of uh, quite significant deprivation, the school has invested heavily in a nurturing agenda because they, dis they, they considered what to do with the £65,000 that the school had at their disposal and decided that the obstacles to learning for young people in that school were in terms of the, the background and the condition and the circumstances that they were living in. So the school has invested heavily in a nurturing and structured play environment, which is resulting in the children, when they embark on learning, which is probably not till about maybe 9.30 in the morning, 9.45 in the morning, they've had a very good experience of structured and organised play and welcome and nurture to relax the children into being able to be ready to learn in a way that they wouldn't have been if it was in the door and trying to start learning at nine o'clock in the morning. Now, I don't cite these examples to say these are the holy grail. I cite them to say these are choices that are now available to schools because schools have the resources at their disposal to look at their children and to say, well, what is going to work for the children in our school, in our catchment, in our circumstances? What do they need most to ensure that they can fulfill their potential? So that greater sense of empowerment is fundamental in our schools to enable schools to take those decisions appropriate to the needs of young people. And I want to take further steps in the direction of empowerment by the work that we're taking forward on the Head Teachers Charter to essentially formalise the scope and the flexibility that individual schools and head teachers will have to configure their education approach to meet the needs of young people within the school. Because what I think is our, our system, in many respects, is just too rigid. Yesterday, I was in Inverness over the last couple of days meeting with our International Council of Education Advisors, and these are some of the most eminent educationalists in the world who willingly are given their contribution to the work that we're doing here in Scotland because they're passionately committed to the agenda of excellence and equity that is driving the Scottish education system. 
one of their observations about our system is that it's just too tight. It's not giving people the flexibility within the system to exercise their professional judgment and their professional capacity. So Pazzi Salber from Finland said to me at uh, you know, the last session of the International Council, you need to get your system to loosen up a bit, to give a bit more scope to your professionals to, frankly, to exert themselves within the system rather than being um, constrained by unnecessary protocol and regulation. And I'm, con and I'm convinced by that argument. And that's what lies at the heart of the thinking behind pupil equity funding and the head teacher's charter. I don't want to... I don't want to put a whole heap of administrative and bureaucratic burdens onto schools, but I do want to give you the scope to reshape what you are doing to be able to make a bigger difference in the lives of young people. So that empowerment agenda is not only philosophically consistent with Curriculum for Excellence, in my view it's an imperative in being able to deliver Curriculum for Excellence and to meet the needs of a diverse range of young people in different circumstances around the country, and we should respond positively to that. At the heart of the empowerment agenda is a very heavy emphasis on the need for professional development and professional enhancement. In this respect, I want to say a few things about STEP and what STEP has, has undertaken over the last few years. If you go and look at the um, the report that was undertaken into Curriculum for Excellence by uh, the OECD in 2015. And one of their um, challenges to the system is to encourage greater collaboration. They looked at the Scottish education system and said you don't have enough collaboration amongst professionals. STEP was an exception to that because this is collaboration. This is about teachers voluntarily coming together on a Saturday morning, well not just Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon as well, and no doubt if the raffle goes on forever Saturday night too, <laughs> um, to, to bring together your professional experience, share that, listen to others, share your perspective, debate what's been working well, what's not been working well, what you can learn from others. And fundamentally, we will only strengthen Scottish education if we have got good professional dialogue and collaboration within our system. So STEP has performed a really useful and valuable role in that respect, but I don't think we could expect STEP to do everything. So that's why I've moved to establish the Regional Improvement Collaboratives, because what they are about, and what, well, let me tell you what they're not going to be about. What they are not going to be about is an added bureaucratic burden within the education system. And if they become that, then I will have failed in my mission. So let's just be honest about what they've not got to become. And I've got to make sure they don't become that. And when I was talking to Anne just before we, we, we started off today, Anne was reflecting that, and I think this is a fair reflection, that the regional improvement collapses, they're in their early stages. But just now they're very much gatherings of senior figures within Scottish education. Very quickly, they've got to be gatherings of professionals. Where within the six geographical areas of Scotland, in the southeast, in the Forth Valley Collaborative, the South West, the West, the North, and in the Tayside area, professionals are coming together to do much what you are doing today, and that is to share professional practice about how we can all learn from each other about the interventions in, um, in teaching structures, in teaching styles, in pedagogy, in nurture, in a whole range of different questions which can enhance the educational experience of young people in Scotland. And if regional improvement collaboratives do not provide a forum for that professional dialogue to take place, then they will have failed. So I will be interacting very strongly with the regional improvement collaboratives to make sure that style is what emerges, that we have a platform for professional inquiry. But I need your help in that, because I need you to be pushing into these regional improvement collaboratives to make sure that's the agenda that they actually follow and offering the great things that you are doing and seeing within your schools, the things that you think are working, and the things, as importantly, that you think are not working, so that we can learn how to enhance the practice of education in Scotland. I think we need to have in professional development a, a, a strong focus on the development of, of good and strong leadership within our education system. And leadership isn't just about head teachers. Leadership is about in every classroom in our country. 
And again, from my discussion with the, the teachers of Uphall Primary School, individually, and this is why I have these interview sessions so that I can get good lines for my speeches, the teachers in that school are all taking on specific priorities in, in relation to the development of education within the school, whether it's about numeracy or about literacy, about reading groups or whatever it happens to be. Individual teachers are exercising leadership of professional development within the school. This is not something to be left just to head teachers. You are classroom teachers who are here to learn and to share your best practice, and that's exactly what we need more of in the education system. I think thirdly, we need a much greater focus on a vibrant debate about pedagogy and about our approaches to learning. A few weeks ago, um, uh, the, a primary school in Renfrewshire, and I'm just struggling to get the name, I think it's St Anthony's, uh, if there's anyone here from Renfrewshire they can maybe correct, is it St Anthony's? St Anthony's Primary School in around about Linwoodish, Linwood? Johnston, Johnston, thank you. I'm glad there's some geography experts <laughs> in, in, the, in the audience today. They won the UK um, literary, literary, literary School of the Year Award. A wee primary school in Johnston won the UK Literary School of the Year. And I heard the head teacher on the radio, Good Morning Scotland, it was about the only cheerful bit of news on Good Morning Scotland that day. And she explained how this had happened. And when you listened and thought carefully about what the head teacher was saying, she essentially said the school had looked at how they were teaching young people to read and to enjoy literacy and had come to the conclusion their existing practice was not working and was not effective. And they'd all been involved in a, 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 a literacy programme with, supported by Renfrewshire Council, engaged with, uh, in, heavily engaged in with the University of Strathclyde, and they had essentially changed the way in which they taught children to read within the school and how they appreciated and enjoyed literacy. Now, as I listened to that, not only was I bursting with pride about what the St Anthony's had achieved, I also thought this was a tremendously courageous message for the head teacher to be prepared to share with the country on the airwaves because it involved changing professional practice and accepting that what you were doing today isn't maybe good enough and you want to do it better because you want to do the best for the children and then so you sometimes have to confront the fact that maybe it's not going the way you want it to go and there's nothing wrong with that that's the strength of education we're all learning so that openness to improvements in pedagogy is crucial to our education system and the final aspect of professional development is that we and by that means i, I mean principally me and others have got to face up to the fact that we have over time restricted the roots for professional development of teachers and that's been a mistake and we'll have to address it so in the next steps do document on education reform last year i opened up a conversation about how do we develop new routes for career development because largely today <laughs> Routes for professional development for teachers are into administrative and organisational leadership within schools, and it's not good enough. There have to be other routes, and I've been looking very closely at the system in Singapore, where they essentially have three routes for professional development within education. One is through administrative and organisational leadership, because of course, you know, we'll always still need to have head teachers, um, thankfully. Um, secondly, opportunities for subject specialism development where teachers can progress and be rewarded for developing subject specialism and thirdly for what I would call um, pedagogic leadership where you might develop a strength in numeracy or literacy pedagogy and be or nurture pedagogy or play pedagogy and be essentially rewarded for that investment in your professional development and when I've attended the International Summit of the Teaching Profession when I go to that I go with um, some of our trade union our professional association representatives and one of the obligations when you go to the International Summit of the Teaching Profession is you've got to agree joint commitments between the government and your professional associations about how you will enhance professional development 
And what I've agreed with the, um, the professional associations is that this strand of our work will be a strand of joint development between the government, our local authorities and um, our professional associations to make sure that we create these routes for professional development. And I'm very committed to making sure that we make progress on these routes because these routes will give us um, the greater opportunities for outstanding classroom teachers to be able to stay outstanding classroom teachers but be rewarded for it and encouraged to stay in it and to share their professional practice with others, which is what professional collaboration and development must be about, if it is about anything. So those um, four areas about the development of greater collaboration and professional development, the development of leadership, uh, the focus on improvements in pedagogy and the new routes for career development are some of the ideas and elements that I think are crucial to take forward professional development. Why does this all matter? Well, it matters because <coughs> that is all about how we strengthen Scottish education and deliver what I know we're all in this room to deliver, and that is equity and excellence within Scottish education. Because, you know, when I... I've come to this, you know, I had a background as a finance minister, I've come to education with a, a fresh and open mind, I've looked at it, I've thought carefully, I've listened to people, what is it, what is it that will deliver my objectives of excellence and equity for all within our education system, and what it will depend upon is in my view two things, the quality of learning and teaching in our classrooms, and the leadership that exists within our education system. And remember, I don't just define leadership as head teachers, I define leadership as those who are leading our education system at whatever level and in whatever way. And there is a vital role for empowered classroom leadership to develop in that process. And the great advantage that we have is that today, I don't think we've got a clearer purpose, or we've ever had a clearer purpose in Scottish education because you know, I've been put into this job by the First Minister to do something bold and that is to close the poverty related attainment gap in Scottish education that has frankly, when I think back to my days in Scottish education, the poverty related attainment gap existed then, back in the dark ages of the 1970s and 1980s. It existed then and it's been existing ever since. And the First Minister has established the strongest priority that we have to address this issue, and I'm in here to give the leadership to make sure that by delivering excellence and equity for all, we close that poverty-related attainment gap. So that clarity of purpose is a great strength in Scottish education today, and the beauty of it is that when I go into schools the length and breadth of the country, I see schools thinking about how they can contribute towards delivering excellence and equity for all in every school and looking at how they can contribute to the improvement objectives that we have about education in Scotland. Now, what I've said to you so far has all been about kind of the inner confines of the education system. I want to close with a link to other material that you will wrestle with today because I don't want you to go away from my addressed this morning thinking that I'm just saying it's all up to you. You're the teachers, it's all up to you. Fix it all in the classroom, because you can't. You can help us significantly. But there's a broader perspective in all of this, and you'll hear this from Suzanne Zedek this, after, uh, this afternoon, um, or maybe later this morning. And I want to say very directly and very publicly how much I admire the work that Suzanne is taking forward to raise awareness and understanding of the impact of adverse childhood experiences on young children and young people within our society today. Because if I go back to my experience in Caldeen Primary School yesterday morning, that school has looked at its children, and many of you will have done the same thing, and realised there's not a hope in hell of these young people being able to learn if they're not better supported by the time they embark on their learning that day. And that's about addressing, in aspects within the education system, how we can overcome some of the impact of 
adverse childhood experiences within a nurturing environment. But it's also an obligation on the rest of the country to do something about it too, and the rest of the public service to do something about it too. So a few weeks ago, but th there's been a really interesting development. Suzanne was just saying to me this morning that a year ago, um, there was the first showing of the film Resilience in Scotland. And I've, um, I've seen the film, I, I watched it in the company of a range of senior civil servants and um, stakeholders from around the country and our third sector organisations. We watched it together and then we moved the chairs away from theatre style into a round, a round circle and we had a conversation about what are we going to do about this? Because it's all very well to watch a film, what are we going to do about it? And we agreed amongst us to draw together a lot of good work, and there is a lot of good work going on in this, between the police, the health service, um, our third sector organisations, the education system, the broader social work services within local authorities, and work collectively and collaboratively to try to make sure that all of our individual interventions are pointing in the same direction to tackle adverse childhood experiences and try to then make sure that the young people that are presenting themselves in your schools are as best able to be learners that they possibly can be. Because they'll never be good learners if we don't tackle their adverse childhood experiences. It's just not going to work. Now, have we finished the journey? Have we got, a, have we got all the answers? Have we got all lined up? No, we've not. But what I'm pleased about is that we're beginning to make the big steps to do that. So a few weeks ago, I convened a, a gathering at Bella Houston Academy in Glasgow. And at that meeting were the Health Secretary, the Justice Secretary, the Community Secretary, myself as the Education Secretary, the Children and Young People's Minister, a range of stakeholders, a range of um, public sector practitioners, leaders, about 100 of, of us from the police, the health service, uh, social work, um, a range of third sector organisations. And the First Minister came as well and stayed for the whole event to make it clear that this has the highest priority within government to make sure we get our act together to support the education system in making sure we do everything we can out with the education system to minimise the scale of the challenge you face to overcome that objective. Now, the practical manifestation of all of that for you is that I suspect, well, I don't suspect, I know you are wrestling within your, within your classrooms with some deep social problems, and we have to try to help you to, to, well, to help you to overcome those problems for children as a barrier to learning by what we do in the public services to support that. So, the education agenda cannot be taken forward in isolation. It has to be taken forward in an environment, collectively and collaboratively, supported by other players in the public sector to make sure that we're doing our best to create the best platform for learning for young people in Scotland. So when you hear Suzanne this afternoon, please listen to her in the context that the government is seriously engaging in the agenda that she is raising with us and in the problems and issues that have to be overcome as a consequence to address the issues that she is raising. And if we do that, we'll create a much stronger platform for learning and a much greater ability for us as a community to be able to deliver excellence and equity for all within Scottish education. And if we do that, if we weave all of this together, then the objective the First Minister has set of, of eliminating the poverty-related attainment gap in Scottish education over a 10-year period is possible to be accomplished. And if we do that, we'll have been doing the very, very best we possibly could do, the finest thing we could ever possibly do for the young people of Scotland in securing their futures through education. Thanks very much. It's started off in Glasgow and we're now, I'm now running the North Lanarkshire one and we're doing health, social work, charity. The wee microphone Oh, sorry. Start again. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I'm running it on my own because as a teacher I'm so frustrated and 
the barriers that I come across. So what I would like is how do we have help? Because we're running it on our own. These are all grassroots movements. I'm organising training, resilience, uh, filming, and I'm doing it in the secondary schools. Where I'm working with um, health, education, lots of charities, but I'm doing it on my own and we need help. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the first thing I want to say is I'm looking forward to coming to your prize giving in <laughs> June at the school, Clyde Valley High School. Second thing is following the logic of what I've just said to you about the multi agency nature of all of this, you shouldn't be doing it on your own. So, multi, so multi agency support should be coming together. So sitting at that gathering at the Houston Academy are the, you know, the leaders of local government within Scotland who preside over education and social work. And then NHS Lanarkshire would have been there as well. Yeah. And that's what we've got to weave together to make sure that you're well supported in tackling these issues, raising awareness and equipping others with the techniques to be able to support this. So as I say, we're at the... I'm not trying to stand here and say it's all in place and it's all fixed. I'm, I'm here saying I recognise the challenge here. We are determined to make the, the progress we need to make in this area of policy and you need to be on the receiving end of the support to enable you to do exactly that. And that should come from the participation of a range of different organisations that are able to, uh, to support that effort at a local level. So um, I think the... You know, obviously, we're doing a lot of work to reinforce the next steps of encouraging that support to be in place at local level, uh, but it's got to feel like that to yourselves as, you, uh, as you're doing that work at local level. But I assure you, bringing together the agencies is the route by which we, um, we need to do to take it forward. Well, I'm actually also conducting um, research for, as well as a teacher, I'm also at Aberdeen University, and right now I'm conducting, conducting a research project um, which I would happily share with you once I write it up. Well, <laughs> what I well but the, the other thing, and so I should have said this, your experience is crucial in this process of development of how we handle ACES. So what I'll do is make sure that you've got a contact into um, the team in the Scottish Government that's dealing with ACES, because you'll have a perspective. It's all very well for me to stand here and say, you know, with you know, the benefit of my government briefing, this is what we're doing. What it feels like to you on the ground is what it's like. That's the more important thing. So we need to hear that. So I'll make sure out of today we get your contact details and I'll put you in touch with our team who are looking at this so we can hear your perspective, what it's like, so we can then start to address that. Thank you. And I think, sorry, I'm, I'm going to cut it because we need to stick to time for the workshops and I do want to make a point of thanking John for lots of things. Um, if there's a question, I'll, 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 I'll destroy your workshop. <laughs> <laughs> there, was a, there was a lady there with the glasses on. Can, can I just point out, you've got your hands full being second minister and secretary of education. You're not getting to cure the step conference as well. There <laughs> <laughs> you go, though. I'll, I'll, I'll take it, you know. Exactly. I know when, I know I when might, I'm beating. I might, I might, of course, regret this. Ah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, <laughs> well, All right, when are you going to bring back this? That's a yes or no. Well, um, I, 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 I don't want... See what I said about new routes for career development? That's kind of what I've got in my mind. I, don't, I think the Chartered Teacher Programme, it, it sort of came and went before I became the Education Secretary. And it, it didn't... It did, so I can blame my predecessors. <laughs> um, but it, it, it didn't seem to... I think it worked in some respects, but it didn't work in all respects. So what we've got to meet, so I'm looking for son of chartered, son or daughter of chartered, so <laughs> daughter of chartered teacher uh, is what I'm looking at. And um, those routes for career development are what I've got in my mind as the, as the successor, let me be neutral on that, the successor to the chartered teacher system. Because I think it's, you know, Take from my message today, I don't think it's good enough for us just to say, if you want to get on in teaching, is to go for administrative leadership. It's not enough to have that available. We've got to have broader routes. So uh, we're getting on with that. Yeah. Never was a round of, round of applause more guaranteed.
the answer. Well, maybe. 